walking on water. <laughs> Isn't it good that we're able to walk on water when we have two inches of rain overnight? No. Um, I want to talk about walking on water and why we don't walk on water. Why don't we walk on water? And I think I, I think that we don't walk on water because we don't think it's socially acceptable. What would other people think? What would they say? What would they do? You know, something that everybody says is negative and that you're supposed to cry and moan and be upset about. Society says these things are bad. And so we have to play that game to be socially acceptable. You know, it, how many things in your life have you kind of slid through to be socially acceptable? Probably a few. Am I right? How many things have you done or not done because it would bother somebody else? I said orgasm how many times in one talk? This was a long time ago. If you don't remember that, maybe that's good. <laughs> I'm not one for social convention usually, but I still find myself doing this. We all do. Um, but we're not living in our power, and we're not making decisions based on who we really are. So I want to talk more about the power of decision. This is the power of decision part two. There is a part three. We'll see what happens next month. We have to move out of these socially accepted norms, and we have to stand in our truth. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks, because the truth is nobody else matters. I know that sounds harsh. I know there's people we love. I know there's people we care about. But the truth is we have to do what's right for us. And I told somebody very recently that the decisions that we make that we know are right for us, are inevitably right for everybody that they affect. Anybody around us that these decisions affect, it's ultimately the divine right thing for them. Whether you think they understand it or not, whether you think they're going to like it or not, but when you make a decision for yourself, you're standing in your power. In the power of decision, Raymond Charles Barker talks about intuition. And that intuition isn't about necessarily hearing those little voices or we all know what to do. That's a given. Inside of you is the knowledge to know what the answers are, what the next move is. You know. Social norms tell you, oh, I don't know. What do you want for dinner? I, I, I don't know. Rick tells this story about his daughters when they were young, and he'd say, what do you guys want to eat? I, I don't know. And he'd say, you want Italian? Oh, no, we don't like that. You want tacos? No, no, we don't like that. <laughs> but they wouldn't step out and say what they wanted. And power of decision is about stepping out and saying what you want. And you've got to say it to the universe, and then you start saying it to people. But you only say it to the people that are going to support you. Don't go to your worst critics. Don't do it. They're not going to like it. The last person I told we were going to move was my middle son. He's my worst critic. I already knew he was going to be the one who would be the most upset. Now, I have to preface this which, with I have the least relationship with this child that I do with any of my kids. I have three kids. I talk to my oldest son on a regular basis. I talk to my daughter on a regular basis. The middle one, we go months. He's the one who's upset I'm moving. <laughs> I don't know. I've been here eight years. He's been here twice. You know? But don't go to your worst critics. Stand in your strength first. Then you have that power inside of you. Intuition isn't about which aisle to go up and down to find the closest parking place. That's not important. We can do that, but that's not what it's really about. Intuition is about self-awareness. 
And the only way to be self-aware is to spend time with you, examining what you really want out of your life. You can have absolutely anything you want out of your life, so long as it doesn't hurt another human being, if you choose to. And that's this choice, this decision. So what we need, rather than the best parking place, or the right color car, what we need is a greater idea of who and what we are and what we are capable of. Because every single one of us is capable of amazing and great things. Every single one of us. We are not small and insignificant. We're not less than somebody and better than somebody else. We're all the same. We all have the same power, the same ability to make decisions that are right for us, that are right for our world. God wants powerful, happy people. Are you a powerful, happy person? That's what we're looking for. Spirit wants you to understand the allness and fullness of who and what you are. That's why you're here. Do you know that's why you're here in this room? That's why you come here to understand that you are greater than this, back to this social concept of what we are. That you're greater than what you compare yourself to others as being. That you are divine and magnificent. That's what you are. Raymond Charles Barker also talks about not defining the future too much. you got to define something. You know, in order for us to move to North Carolina, okay, we've got to put the house on the market here. It's kind of a requirement, you know. Um, my life right now, I need the money from this house to go put a down payment on the next one, so I need to sell my house. If I don't ever put my house on the market, am I ever going to move? <coughs> not, not the way I want to. You know, I want to go buy a, a house and have a bigger shop and room to have a home. i got to tell you guys, it's exciting. We put our dining room back together this week, <laughs> which sounds odd, and there's a few chuckles like, what? I used to have a dining room. I mean, I have a pretty dining room table and chairs and a really nice, custom china cabinet and all that stuff was the table was pushed in the corner and the china cabinet had gone into the music room and I had put up folding tables and that's where I was sewing because I was cramped in my little 10 by 12 bedroom where I started sewing when we moved in there and business has gotten so big I needed more room and I needed places to stack fabric that was already cut and ready to go and Put the dining room back together. <laughs> now, it's not done. But the furniture is back. <laughs> I'm still cutting on the dining room table this week, but maybe by next week I won't even be doing that anymore. I've had to transition. I haven't been able to have anybody over for dinner in like five years of the eight years we've lived here. Because I haven't had a dining room table. I had to set up a card table in the middle of the living room so only people who really knew us really well and were really close and wouldn't care were invited. It wasn't very many. We're going to have a house with a dining room. And we're going to have a basement that has the business. We're allowing our life to unfold because this concept of these amazing drums has transformed our lives completely. And we went from working other jobs to staying home, working for ourselves and manufacturing these and traveling all over the country. It has been an incredible joy that I never could have dreamed about. Never. I had to see something bigger than what was happening, and I didn't have to know what it was. How many of you have heard the story of how we started making Moyo drums? One, two, okay. It's kind of an important story in this. 
See, what happened was we moved here to Oakhurst. Now, we moved here because of Stephen's flutes. Rick had, had, been, had a gift. Somebody gifted him one of Stephen's flutes. I met Stephen at a, at a little event down in Palm Springs. And our friend Jack bought Rick one of Stephen's flutes for his birthday. And within about a week, Rick was on the phone to this guy, finding his name, and on the phone to this guy to say, OK, I want this flute. I love this flute, but I want one that plays with it so I can record and make music that goes together. And Stephen, of course, helped him quite a bit. And then he said, you know, I'm going to be back in the Palm Springs area just a few more weeks from now. You could actually pick out exactly what flute you wanted. I said, great. So we go down to this event a few weeks later, and Rick buys flute number two. And while he's there, he finds flute number three sitting on the table. This is the way these things are. Flute number three is on the table. So next time Rick has a good job come up, um, he was doing remodels and home repairs and things like that. And when a job came up that was a really good one, um, I show up with pizza for him and his buddy um, the first day when all the materials are being delivered and he's on the phone talking to Stephen ordering flute number three. Flute number four came quickly after, but we decided to drive up here to pick up flute number four and have them all checked out, make sure they all sounded perfect together. And we saw Oakhurst. And we went, wow, this would work. We had wanted out of the Palm Springs area for some time. It had grown too big and too crowded for us. And so we looked at each other and said, I could live here. And he said, I could live here. And we needed to stay in California because we were trying to get custody of Ricky. If you leave the state when you're trying to get custody, forget it, you'll never get custody of your kids. So we had to stay in California. I, I preface this with, guys, if we weren't going to stay in California then, we, we wanted to go somewhere else at that point. But we had to wait. So we came here. And because we came here, we go to an event up in, where was that? Grass Valley. Grass Valley. And that wasn't quite to Grass Valley, but it was up that way. It was, yeah. it was up outside of Sacramento. And this guy shows up with a propane tank with cuts in it and played it in the campground. And Rick played it. And the guy said, oh, you're really good. Will you play on stage with me tomorrow? And, and you can play the drum, and I'll play flute. And Rick said, OK. And it was just a silly little spring event that they do up there. And then the guy said, I got a pattern for this. You should go make one not knowing what he was doing. Um, bless his heart, Mike thought, you know, Rick will make one for himself. Well, Mike Oitzman was trying to make these and sell them, and eventually his website said, forget it, go call Rick Dunlap, because <laughs> he does a much better job. Because Rick is both a musician and a metal worker, so he understood the metal and understood what to do with it. So we make a few of these things. He sends me down to Fresno to go buy propane tanks. So I go down to Fresno and I'm buying these empty brand new propane tanks and bringing them home. And I think it was drum number three. Um, again, because of the people we know, Michael and Joanne Freemeyer, um, kind of distant friends of PLC. Um, Michael's in the Course in Miracles group. Michael and Joanne Freemeyer are coordinating the North Fork, I don't know, what is it, a spring festival or a fall festival that they did in North Fork Street Fair. And Joanne said, could you come do music? I need like an hour and a half of music. And we went, an hour and a half of music? Are you kidding me? And we had Ricky and Rick and me, and I don't play much. But we go down there, and we made a set list. We sat in the music room and fiddled around with what flute goes with what. And we took this drum number three, and that was